In this video, we're going to review linear momentum for AP Physics 1. We're going to start by defining momentum. So momentum is the product of an object's mass and its velocity. Momentum is a vector, which means it has a magnitude and a direction. And the, the equation for momentum is P is equal to mv. Note that the direction of the momentum is in the same direction as its velocity. Since the unit for mass is kilogram and unit for velocity is meters per second, the unit for momentum is kilograms meters per second. Here we have a large truck and a small car, and they have the same momentum. The large truck has a large mass and the little car has a small mass, but if they have the same momentum, that means the large truck has a smaller velocity and the small car has a large velocity. So if their mass times velocity is equal to each other, we say they have the same momentum. Now we're going to define impulse. Impulse is the product of the average force and the time interval during which that force is exerted on the system. Impulse is a vector, which means it has a magnitude and a direction. The equation for impulse is J. Sometimes we use the symbol I, but often it will be capital J, is equal to average force times the time interval. The unit for impulse is newton seconds, and the unit for, because the unit for force is newtons, and the unit for time is seconds. On a net force versus time graph, the area under the curve represents the impulse. You can also have a negative area that would represent a negative impulse. Let's take a look at an example. Here's a bat that hits a baseball. The bat exerts a force on the baseball, and the force on the baseball times the time interval that the bat is pushing on the baseball uh, is equal to the impulse. Now, because we know about Newton's third law, how there's also a reaction force here, which is equal but in the opposite direction, and the time interval will be the same. Uh, that means there's going to be an impulse on the bat that is equal to the impulse on the baseball, except they're in opposite directions. Now we're going to connect momentum and impulse. The impulse momentum theorem tells us that the impulse exerted on object is equal to the change in its momentum. So we're going to start with Newton's second law to derive this relationship, F net equals MA. We know that the acceleration by definition is the change in velocity over the change in time. So we can write this as F net equal to M delta V over delta T. If I move the delta T to the left, I get F net delta T is equal to, on the right hand side, I get M delta V. I can rewrite this as mv final minus mv initial because delta v is just final velocity minus initial velocity. And we have a name for mv. We call this momentum, and the symbol for momentum is p. Uh, and so we can write that, rewrite this as p final minus p initial. So on the left-hand side, we have f net delta t, which is impulse. The symbol for impulse is capital J. And the right-hand side, we have the change in momentum, which we can write as delta p. So impulse is equal to the change in momentum. This is the equation for impulse momentum theorem. Now, if we go back to uh, this equation up here, and if I move the delta t to the right, uh, if I divide delta t on both sides, I get f net is equal to delta p divided by delta t. And this is significant because if we ever get a graph, a momentum versus time graph, then we know that the slope of that graph represents the net force. Next, we're going to talk about the conservation of momentum. I'm going to start with the impulse momentum theorem that we just talked about. And uh, impulse is capital J is equal to the final momentum minus the initial momentum. But if the impulse is zero, there's no net force acting on the system, then we have on the left hand side, zero is equal to P final minus P initial. Moving that PI to the left, I get PI equals PF. So conservation of momentum is very useful when there is no impulse on the system, no net force on the system. And we can rewrite PI equals PF as M1V1 plus M2V2. This is the momentum of the objects in your system before the collision. And then M1V1 prime plus M2V2 prime. This is the momentum uh, of the objects in your system after the collision. And sometimes uh, we might have an explosion, we'll, we'll, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So momentum is conserved if there is no net external force acting on the system. What we mean by conserved means that it stays the same. So the total initial momentum equals the total final momentum if there is no external force acting on the system. 
Conservation of momentum is very helpful in collisions, especially when there are no external net force acting on your system. There's no impulse on your system. Uh, so we're going to take a look at some different types of collisions. We're going to start with elastic collisions. In an elastic collision, two objects collide, and their initial momentum, total momentum, is equal to the final total mo momentum. The total initial kinetic energy is also equal to the final kinetic energy. Example of this would be like billiard balls, although in real life, you do have some energy loss because it's converted into heat. Next, we have inelastic collisions. Uh, once again, these are objects that are colliding, hitting each other, and the momentum is also conserved. So the initial total momentum equals the final total momentum. However, there is some kinetic energy loss. Uh, so maybe some of that energy is lost and transferred to sound energy or heat energy, or maybe it may have deformed the object. Example of this would be a car crash. Uh, third, we have a perfectly inelastic collision. This is when the two objects stick together. Their momentum is uh, still conserved, though the initial total momentum equals the final total momentum. Uh, there is maximum kinetic energy loss. And uh, an example of this would be like a clay ball and a block. They hit each other and they stick together. Next, we're going to take a look at an explosion. So in an explosion, internal forces are moving objects in the system apart. So here we have a spring and we have these two carts in our system. And momentum is conserved as long as the system is isolated, which means that there are no net external forces. So we're assuming that there's no friction, for example. We're going to make right positive. And if there are if momentum is conserved, that means the initial momentum equals the final momentum. Because initially it's not moving, I'm going to uh, write zero on the left. And then after it explodes, uh, the two carts are moving away from each other. Uh, on the right, we have cart M, V2. The momentum of the car on the right is going to be M times V2. And the momentum of the car on the left will be 2M, that's the mass of the cart, times V1, that's the velocity of the cart. And we're going to do minus because it's in the negative directions. Uh, we're going to move uh, the 2M V1 to the left and notice that the M's cancel out. And we see that V2 is equal to twice the velocity of the cart on the left. Now we're going to take a look at the center of mass. And the center of mass concept is helpful because sometimes you have all these different objects or particles in a system, and this can often simplify the problem. The center of mass is the point at which the entire mass of a system can be considered to be concentrated. And the equation for the center of mass is xcm equal to m1x1 plus m2x2 plus dot 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 divided by m1 plus m2 plus dot dot dot. On the bottom, essentially, you have the total mass. If you divide t on both sides, we get x over t, x over t, x over t, and we know that that is time, it is velocity. And so the center of mass velocity is equal to m1v1 plus m2v2 plus dot 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 divided by the total mass. Now we know that m1v1 is just momentum. So if you add up the total momentum, that's the number you would get at the top. And if you take the total momentum divided by the total mass of your system, you get the velocity of your center of mass. If there's no external net force, then the center of mass velocity is constant. And now we're going to work through the classic problem of the man on a boat. So here we have a man on a boat. He's going to be walking to the left. And as he walks to the left, he's, his feet will be pushing the boat to the right. Our system here is going to be the man and the boat. And the forces on our system is Fg, the force of gravity, and Fb, the buoyant force. The length of the boat is L. And the center of mass of the man and the boat system is going to be at this location here. And uh, the half, half of the length of the boat, which is the center of mass of the boat, is going to be right here, which is going to be L over 2. 
So to calculate the center of mass of our system, we're going to use our center of mass equation, which is equal to the mass of the boat times the, because the boat is an extended object, we're going to treat it as if all the mass were at the center of mass of the boat, so which will be right here, which is L over 2, plus the mass of the man times the location of the man, which is going to be uh, the length of the boat. So that's going to be capital L divided by the total mass, the mass of the boat and the mass of the man. Now, the person is going to walk to the left. As the person walks to the left, the person is pushing the boat uh, with its feet to the right. So the boat's going to move to the right, man moves to the left. And the man is going to now be at a location X, which we'll call X. And the center of mass, now we're going to call, call it uh, XCM prime. And we're going to use our center of mass equation once again after the person has walked to the left. So we're going to take the mass of the boat times the location of the center of mass of just the boat. So that's going to be L over 2 plus X, because now it's moved to the right a distance of X, plus the mass of the man times the location of the man, which is going to be X, divided by the total mass. Now, since there are no external net forces acting on our man-boat system, the center of mass before the man walked is equal to the center of mass after the man has walked all the way to the left. And so this is the key idea right here. So we're going to set these two equations equal to each other, and then we're going to solve for, the, for x. So after we uh, set these two equations equal to each other, we notice that the m, the total mass uh, on, on the bottom of the fraction, um, will cancel out. That leaves us with ml over 2 plus ml is equal to, and I'm going to multiply the mass here, mx plus ml over 2 plus mx. And so the m over ml over 2 gets canceled out. That leaves us with ml equal to x times the total mass, mass of the boat plus the mass of the man. I'm going to next divide uh, the total mass on both sides. So it's going to cancel out on this side. So x is going to equal ml over uh, the total mass. Uh, m is 70 kilograms. The uh, length of the boat is 2.5. The mass of the boat is 100 kilograms. And the mass of the man is 70 kilograms. And uh, our, we get a answer of 1.03 meters. So after the person walks all the way to the left, um, the person will be at a location of 1.03 meters.